Good afternoon, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to Bilston SDA Church's live stream and to our Zoom worship. Today is Sabbath, the 3rd of July uh, in the year 2021. We are happy and excited that you have chosen to worship with us today. Uh, for those on uh, live stream, we welcome you and we ask you to uh, like and subscribe and share the link with your friends and your family so more people can join us uh, on our Sabbath worship, which uh, starts at 12 noon through to 1 p.m. I'd like to um, read in your hearing uh, Psalms 150 uh, as we commence our divine worship. It reads, praise ye the Lord, uh, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. And verse six, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. We will open our service this morning with the hymn 309, I Surrender All.
we seek the Lord in prayer? Our gracious God, thank you, Lord, for all your blessings throughout the week and given us this beautiful Sabbath morning where we all can come and give you thanks and praise to their name for your blessings. Father in heaven, I pray for our church members who are in presence in the Zoom and people who are not able to join in Zoom. Bless them and guide them, Lord. Give them all the needful help that they need in their lives. I also pray for all the viewers we, who are watching this program. Bless them and guide them and lead them, Lord. I pray for our speaker, Pastor Mohan, as he's going to break the bread of life from thy throne. Touch each lips, whatever he speak. The church carefully listen and practice in our daily lives. Bless his ministry and his family, Lord. Use him in the mighty service. I pray for our worldwide churches around the world and our conferences in this country and union. Bless all the leaders to uplift this church for the betterments for their cause. I once again commit each and every one of us into the care and keeping and give us these Sabbath blessings and help us to be loyal and faithful to thee. This ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. more grace when the burdens grow greater he sendeth more strength when the labors increase to added afflictions he added his mercy to multiply trials, his multiplied peace. His love has no limits, his grace has no measure, his power has no boundary. in Jesus he giveth and giveth and giveth again when we have exhausted our soul Father's forgiven is only begun. His love has no limits, His grace has no measure. 
afternoon and happy sabbath to each one of you good to be here i want to thank pastor solomon for asking me if i could do it he asked me for next week but unfortunately i'm not free this week i'm free so i said i will be able to do and thanks for accommodating my request of time and date um i pray that today's sermon will touch someone's lives and we'll never be the same let us pray as we open god's word gracious father as we open your word open our hearts in jesus name amen um i was told solomon told me that um, the theme for this month is it is uh, revival i think that's a wonderful theme to be able to think of revival which is so important for us who are living in the last days i've entitled my sermon this morning as revival the greatest need of the church and the individual revival the greatest need of the church and the individual i want to read a passage from sister white from the book true revival page 91 true revival page 91 it says a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and the most urgent of all our needs i want you to get this statement the revival of true godliness is the greatest and most urgent need of all our needs do we truly believe that is revival a necessary for us do you feel that you need to be revived some of us have been in the church by birth from birth some of us came halfway some of us have stayed for years and years is there any difference in your life do you feel revival or you feel everything is fine alan white says that true godliness a revival of true godliness is the most and the greatest important urgent need of the church why do you think she has to say that because if you read scriptures turn with me to second timothy chapter 
3 please turn your bible second timothy chapter 3 Look at the condition of the church as described by Paul in this passage, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Tell me if the church, our church, resembles this description, chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. But know this, in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. Do you think this description has a meaning to our own church in our times? To me, we, we fit into all the things that has been said here. Therefore, there is a need for a revival in our lives. 200 years ago, a Scottish preacher and a hymn writer by the name of Horatius Bona this is what he said. I looked for the church and I found it in the world. And I looked for the world and I found it in the church. Let me repeat it again. I looked for the church and I found it in the world. And I looked for the world and I found it in the church. This was written 200 years ago. But how true it is of the church today. Tell me in what way is the church different from the world? Honestly speak and try to understand. In what way are we different from the world? What is it that the world has that we don't have? What is it that we have that the world doesn't have? What is the condition of our church? So Dan, Keith Daniel, person said, if we try to win the world by being like the world, what will happen? The world will win over us. Isn't that what sometimes we do? We want to be like the world. We want to be like the world so that we can win the world. This man says, if you want to be like the world in order to win the world, it's the opposite that would happen. The world will win you. You cannot win the world. The world wants to see a difference between us and them. But we are so much like them, what makes us think that they would like to follow us when there's no difference between us and them? Have you thought about that? There's an Adventist preacher once he said, if we are not being missionaries, we become a mission field. If we are not converting people, we need to be converted. I hope you're getting the point. Some of us are so comfortable on Zoom. In fact, I was reading the statistics of last week's Christian magazine. It said, when the lockdown is lifted up, at least 20% of people will not return back to church. At least 20% of people will not return back to church. They're comfortable in their own homes. Convenience is more important than what they think is the loyalty and obedience to God. We are a people, we are Christians of convenience. We don't want to take any risks. Neither do we want to sacrifice anything. Everything has to be spoon fed for us. So if you want to be like the world, we can never win the world. Someone said, today the Christian churches are full of unconverted members with an unconverted pastor trying to reach the unconverted. Today, the churches are full of unconverted members with an unconverted minister trying to reach the unconverted world. Do you think there is success in such a formula? 
unconverted people with an unconverted minister trying to reach the unconverted. No wonder we don't do much the service in the church. You know, most sometimes God has actually called us to be fishers of men. But you know what we have become? We have become keepers of aquariums. We are so busy trying to keep the fish that is within the aquarium. We have hardly any time to catch fish. And if at all, if there is any catch that we make, it is my own family, my niece, my nephew, my church member, my relative, my grown-up child, or somebody from some other church. We just steal sheep from that church and this church. But we true, do we truly convert people who do not know the love of God? Have we have that burden to do something for God? Today, sermon is a bit hard, but they're the reality. I hope you will understand. The greatest problem in the church, as I see as a minister for, I've been pastoring for the last 23 years of my life. One of the greatest challenges I have seen, which is common to every church that I pastor, and I believe it is common to all the churches, is the unity in the church. We lack unity. The longest prayer that Jesus ever prayed when he was upon this earth is recorded in John 17. And that's the prayer of unity for his people, for his disciples, for his church. How successful the devil seems to be in bringing disunity amongst ourselves. Even within Adventist church, we have differences. People from Bilston Church to Wilverhampton Church or some other church, we can't get along to do things together. You do your way, I will do my way. We hardly come together under one umbrella to do God's work. Is that what it is? One of the major reasons why people leave the church, have you realized, have you seen the statistics? One of the major reasons why people leave the church is not because they don't believe in God, neither the teachings of the Bible. It is because of they have a differences with a church member or an elder or a pastor. That's one of the major reasons as to why people walk away from church. Why? We say something, we leave something out. So they don't see any relevance and being in a place where they can't find the true example. Do have you realized many people come to church and still experience loneliness? They sit among people and they're still lonely. In fact, I, I, I was talking to somebody and uh, it, it, many people, if they have an issue or a problem, they would rather confide with an outsider or a work colleague who is not a church member or somebody outsider than to a church member because it's very difficult to keep confidentiality within the church family. We break it, we spread it like wildfire. People are comfortable sharing their problems with outsiders than to their own church because they don't trust them. Is that how we are called to be? If we are such, is the, will there be a revival? I always believe the greatest enemy to Christians is not Hindus, Muslims, atheists, it's Christians themselves. We are our own enemies because we don't practice what we believe. Someone said Adventists that you know, we, some of us Christians are like, uh, we treat the Bible like chewing gum. What do you do with the chewing gum? You can keep it in your mouth for hours and hours and hours. At the end of the day, you spit it out. You don't swallow it. Adventists are so good at sitting and studying Bible. Whole day we can sit, argue, put your point, put my point, try to dissect the word this way and that way. But when it comes to practice, how genuine are we? How much has it transformed our lives personally? and lives as a corporate church. Have you ever thought of that? Most, is that what we are called? And our church life is mostly driven by 
events and programs. For us, church means events and programs. It's almost a routine thing that we do always. Christianity is not a religion of programs and events. I want us to know that. And it is not restricted to certain days and events either. It's Christianity should be a way of life. Christ must be a way of life in our own lives. Is that what we are? It is possible to come to church on a Sabbath and go through all the programs and still not meet Christ personally. I remember reading a story about a boy. There was once children's program. It's a children's day. Every child have given their best and it was a wonderful day. He went back home that evening and he knelt down by his bedside and said, Lord Jesus, we had a wonderful Sabbath today. Such a wonderful program. I wish you were there to witness. How true that is sometimes. We are so busy doing so many things on Sabbath. Have you ever paused to ask, is Jesus in it? Is he glorified in it? Is he uplifted in this? Is it about him or is it about us as a church? Is it a program or is it a way of life that we have chosen to be children of God? Have you thought of those things? Some of us, someone said we are playing church or we are doing church. We are not being church. Are we playing church? Are we doing church or are we being a church? Someone said, if you were to be removed from your locality as a church, will the people around miss you? I don't know about your place, but here in London, where I pastor, if we were removed today from the place where I am right now, the community will rejoice because they will not have no more parking problems. We are no more occupying their spaces. No nuisance. We come on a Sabbath with nice dress, happy smiles, and for the rest of the week, they don't see us. In fact, you know, one church, they thought, every Saturday there's a wedding in this church, they thought. What a testimony. That's all we are. If there's a funeral or a wedding on a Saturday, that's all the neighbors know about us because we look so smart on that day. And the rest of the week, we have nothing to do with our communities. What kind of revival are we talking about? When do we open our eyes to see the reality of your own condition and the condition of the church? We are so comfortable doing the little things that we do and to say, oh, yes, I'm doing my best for my master. Is that what we are? Is that how we are called to see ourselves? Let me read a statement from Ellen White. She says, not all are converted in the church. This is a scary thing for me. There are persons in the church who are not converted and who will not unite in earnest prevailing prayer. Are you one of them? Do you know yourself? How faithful are you to the Lord? How true do you are to your conscience? What do you do when nobody's watching you? Just to come on a Sabbath with a suit and a hand in hand with your spouse or children and sit and preach and teach and do. You think that's what is Christianity all about? If the Lord, if there was a prophet amongst us who can read every thought, every motive and come and sit with you and tell you who you are, would you have the courage to sit in front of him and allow him to reveal yourself who you are? How nicely we wear a mask as though all is well and pretend and even preach like me that all is well. Is that how we are? Is that what we are called to be? She also says, we have far more to fear from within than from without. Some of the dangers we have to face is not from the outside world, right within us, the slackness, the sluggishness, the uneasiness, the convenient Christianity that we have adapted ourselves. Those are more dangerous, like what Jesus said to his people. What goes inside a man is not what defiles him, but what comes out. Pride, jealousy, hatred, envy, malice, lust, 
these are the things that nobody may know about you but those are the ones that destroy your soul that destroy my soul what kind of revival are we talking about are we really serious about revival in our lives or is just a program that we do every month and tick box and say we have done these many programs how many sermons have been have we been hearing from week after week how much of change has they brought in our lives have you thought of that the church is called to rise above its stagnancy right now what is revival revival and reformation are important and they are important uh, ingredients to a church life revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life a quickening of the powers of mind and heart a resurrection from spiritual death that is revival reformation signifies a reorganization once you revive yourself there must be a reorganization of change in your ideas in your theories in your habits and in your practices that's what she says in review and herald february 24 1902 sister white revivals must bring deep searching of our hearts and humility within oneself you know some of us are lulled into false revivals a profession of the truth places men in the church listen to this please a profession of the truth places men in the church but this does not prove that they have a vital connection with the living wine you can be a member of the church all your life pay your tithe keep the sabbath and still be lost that's why she says in a uh, uh, true revival page 50 a profession of the truth places men in the church but this does not prove that they have a vital connection with the living wine how do you know whether a person is genuine or not in the church she says a rule is given by which the true disciple may be distinguished from those who claim to follow christ but have not faith in him what's the what's the rule the one class are fruit bearing the other are fruitless how much are you fruit bearing within your own life within the sphere of your life that is a litmus test whether you are a genuine believer in christ or not pretending most christians pretend as i said we all wear a mask we look different from outside we are something else different what is the skeleton in the closet look like jesus told a very serious thing during his lifetime to his disciples and people matthew 7:21 not all those who say lord lord will enter into kingdom of god but only those who do the will of my father my dear church at bilston i am speaking my heart i'm speaking up for myself as a minister and i hope you will take my message positively today not all those who say lord lord will enter into heaven but only those who do the will of my father will enter into heaven do you know something there are people who preached in his name who did miracles in his name who cast away devils in his name and when the lord comes the answer of the lord to them is i don't know you can you imagine to be to me to be a pastor of a seventh day adventist all my life and when christ comes all that i hear from him is i don't know you i may be telling i preached in bilston church i did this i did this i and yet the answer is i don't know you is that possible to preach in god's name to do miracles in his name and still he doesn't know me let me ask you a question how many of you know david beckham raise your hands let me see are you all with me yes at least yeah, let me thank you how many of you know queen elizabeth yeah how many of you know donald trump yeah the next question is does donald trump know you does david beckham know you does queen elizabeth know you now this is the point i'm trying to say 
there's, it doesn't matter whom you, you know. You, you may know the, all three of them, but what matters is, do they know you? Can that be said about us between our relationship with Christ and us? You say you know Jesus, but the question is, does Jesus know you? Does he really know you? How can, if he knows me, how can he say when he comes the second time, he would say, I don't know you, even though I preached in his name, I cast away devils in his name, I baptized people in his name, yet the answer is, I don't know you, because I have not really been converted. It is possible to be a member of a Seventh-day Adventist church all your life, go through the emotions of church life, Adventism, and still be lost. Please, I beg with you this morning, live intentionally. Pause a moment and think, where am I in my life and in my walk with the Lord right now? Don't do the tick walk ministry. I went to Sabbath. I paid my tithe. I didn't tell a lie. I didn't commit adultery. It's not what you don't do that matters. What you fail to do is what matters also. We are so good at defending ourselves. I'm not this. I'm not this. I'm not this. But have you considered what you're supposed to be and you are not? What was wrong with the fig tree that Jesus had to curse it? You think it was bearing some poisonous fruit instead of figs? No, the simple reason is it has no fruit in its season. It appeared as though it had fruit, but when Jesus went closer, it was deceptive. There was no fruit. Are we sometimes like that? We appear as though we have the fruit by the way we talk, by the way we dress and behave outside. But deep inside, as Jesus said to the Pharisees, their rotten bones. Whited sepulchers look so clean outside, but inside is all rotten bones. Can that be said about me and about you? Have we given time to search our hearts to know what we are? So that is key. I want, I'm so happy you choose this theme, revival. Let me illustrate how you can experience revival with a beautiful story in the Bible. It's a very famous story. I want you all to turn with me your Bibles to Second Chronicles chapter 34. Second Chronicles chapter 34. Second Chronicles chapter 34. This is a beautiful story about Josiah, one of the kings of Judah. Second Chronicles chapter 34. I would like to present eight points from his life. If you're writing down, do write down. If not, you have you please. If you if you're serious about revival, if if you do if you want to see that today's message is not any other sermon that you want to listen and then feel good about it, I want you to take these points and see if there is some lack in your life that if you could put things together. Turn with me to Second Chronicles chapter thirty four where the story of King Josiah is there. Let's see, verse one. It says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king and he reigned, how many? 31 years in Jerusalem. In other words, how old was Josiah when he became a king? It said he was only eight years old, just day before yesterday, that was Thursday, I celebrated uh, eighth birthday for my daughter, the last one, Rosanna. I think she sang in your church once, if I remember. She just turned eight last Thursday. We feel she's so innocent. She doesn't know so many things. She hardly can handle herself. Josiah was only eight years when he began to reign. How could he do that? How was it possible? How is it possible that he became ruler? But anyway, the next verse, let's see what is this. Verse two, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father, David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. This is what I want you to see from verse two. There are three things, though, the three things that verse two highlights about Josiah. Number one, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. 
Have you, have you seen that? If you want a true revival in your life, get this, please. Like Josiah, you need to learn to do what is right in the sight of the Lord. You know, today's mindset, postmodern people, I will do what is right in my sight. You may not like it. You may not approve of it, but that's your opinion. But as for me, I like it. I will do it. Your opinion is different to my opinion. Your morality is different to my morality. You keep yours, I will keep mine. This is the attitude. Now, I'm not talking about the world. Right in the church, we have our own attitudes, our own morality code. It says Josiah did not do what he felt was right. Get this point. He did what was right in the sight of God. What is right in the sight of God may not be right with you, but it doesn't matter for him to do what God, what God feels is right is more important to him than how he feels about it. It is not your convenience that matters. It's God's way of doing things that matter to him. If you truly want a revival in your life, get this from the life of Josiah. You must do what is right in the sight of God, not in your own eyes. That's the number one. No, that's, that's what he teaches me, not in the sight of man. He didn't take a public opinion or a poll to take a survey and to decide whether it is right or wrong. If the Lord said it is, it is. It doesn't matter whether somebody approved it or not, whether somebody agreed with him or not. For him, what mattered is what is right in the sight of God. Even if it is inconvenient for him, it doesn't matter. But that's what the Lord expects. That's what I will do. He's not worried about whether he will lose friends, lose job, lose convenience. That's not what is important to him. So the first point from Josiah's life, I want you to know about revival is this. Do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Not what is right in your own eyes. Because Proverbs says, there's a way that seems right unto a man but the end thereof is death. Most of the choices we make, we are actually making towards our own graves. We need to see God's ways, not our ways. So that's what he did. Now it says he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. The question is, what actually did he do that the scripture says that he did what was right in the sight of the Lord? Next few verses actually tell what he did that say that is actually is right in the sight of the Lord. Turn with me to verse 3 the same chapter, verse 3. What did he do right in the sight of the Lord? Look at the second part of verse 3. It says, in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, and the molden images. What did he do that was right in the sight of the Lord? He made sure that in his kingdom, there is no more images he removed all the images, no matter whether that is made of wood or whatever. He removed every one of them. That's what God expects his children. He said, you should not have any images before me. And being a child who wants to do the will of God, he decided, if I were to do what the Lord wants me to do, I have to remove these images. These carved images of wood and stone and whatever it is, he removed. Do you have images in your life? What is your image? Something that you worship more than God. What, what, in anything that you give more preference than God in your life, that's your image, that's your idol. It could be your spouse, it could be your children, it could be your job, it could be your cricket, it could be your football, it could be anything. If you have more desire to do those things, then to be on your knees and to pray, it's an indication you have more images before God. That's the litmus test for every Christian. We feel so tired to pray and come to church, but it doesn't matter to go for a recreation or something, even if I were to drive for two hours. That shows where your heart is. So first thing he did was, he removed all the images. What else did he do? Verse 4. They broke down the altars of the Baals in his presence and the incense altars which were above them. He cut down 
and the wooden images, the carved images, the molded images, he broke in pieces and made dust of them and scattered it on the graves of those had sacrificed to them. Look at the kind of revival he brought. First, he removed all the images. Second, he took out the idols of who? The Baal God. From whom? From his own people. God's chosen people are worshipping Baal God. So when Josiah came to the throne, he decided that he would do what was right in the sight of God. And to do what was right in the sight of God, the first things he did was to establish God's authority on his life and in the life of his nation. As a result, he removed the Baal God and his images. What did he do with them? It's amazing. Look at the last part. He broke them into pieces and made them into dust and scattered it where? On the graves of those who have actually sacrificed them. In other words, he actually killed those people who were sacri making sacrifices. That's what revival for him was. He did that. What else did he do? Look at verse 5 to 7. He also burned what? The bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. In other words, whoever was the priest who was offering sacrifices to the Baal gods, he caught them together. He killed them and he burned their bones because he wanted complete revival of what God intended. It says he did what was right in the sight of God. What else he did? He did it throughout his country. Look at verse 7. When he had broken down the altars and the wooden images, had beaten the carved images into powder and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. In other words, only when he finished completely eradicating images and idol worships and Baal worship, did he return back to his palace. That's why it is said he did what was right in the sight of God. So my dear church, if you want a true revival in your life and in the life of your church, do this, number one. Do what is right in the sight of God. Not your opinion, not others' opinion, but God's. God's way is the only way for true revival. Second, the same verse. Let's go back to verse 2, 34 verse 2. It says, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. That's part one. Number two, in the same verse, and walked in the ways of his father, David. What is the second thing he did? It says he walked in the ways or he, he walked in the ways of his father, David. Now, I want you to see this. Who was his father? If you know the history, you know, Amon was his father. And Amon's father was Manasseh. Do you know what the Bible says about them? Do you know what the Bible says? Turn with me to the previous chapter, chapter 33. Chapter 33. Second Chronicles chapter 33. Let's read verse 21 and 22. Look at, it says, Ammon was 22 years old when he became king and he reigned 22 years in Jerusalem. Verse 22. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord as his father Manasseh. What kind of father did Josiah have? An evil man. Did he take the footprints of his father? No. Did he take the footprints of his grandfather, Manasseh, who was also a king? Look at what does the Bible say about Manasseh? Verse, chap, same chapter, chapter 33, verse 1 and 2. Manasseh was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. The king who ruled the longest, the Israelites, was Manasseh. And unfortunately, he was the wicked king. I sometimes wonder why God gives long reign for wicked people and good people only reign for a short time. And what does the Bible say about Manasseh? Verse 2, but he did evil in the sight of the Lord. All the abominations he did. Josiah's inheritance or his heritage, his father and his grandfather, both of them are wicked and evil men. And yet, the Bible says in chapter 34, verse 2, he did what he did. He walked in the ways of his father, David. It doesn't mention Ammon. It doesn't mention Manasseh. It mentions his, uh, his ancestry to David. He calls David as his father. What do you learn from this? Who do you follow after? Some of us 
have all kinds of excuses. I come from a broken home. I didn't have a father figure. I grew up in an abusive home. What do you expect from me? This is what is as all sorts of things. What should Josiah say then? Having a grandfather who was wicked, having a father who was evil, and yet he says he didn't follow the father's footprints, neither the grandfather. He followed the ways of his ancestry, David. Who do you follow? Some of us are so quick to follow those people that destroy our lives. Some of the examples that we follow, some of the celebrities we follow, some of the passions we have is to follow these people who have no morality and ethics. They seem to appeal to us more than those godly people. Josiah, even though young, he chose to follow the ways of his ancestry, David, King David, rather than follow. So we have no excuse to say, I grew up in a broken home. I grew up with a single parent. My neighborhood is all drug addict. So what can you expect from me? No. Josiah teaches us that we have to walk in the ways of those who have good reputation, those who can show us the right path. The choices you make determines the path also you take. That's what he did. What is the third one? The same verse. First, Second Chronicles chapter 34, verse 2. The first one is he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. The second, he walked in the ways of his father, David. Third one, look at what he says in the same verse. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. What is the third thing he did? He was not wavered or he was not disturbed by any distractions. He chose to have focus in life. If you want a true revival, let nothing come between you and God. You know, as a king, as a young king, I could imagine so many distractions when maybe he was, when he was trying to destroy the images, kill the people who are worshiping. People would have said, king, don't do it. You may get revolt. You may, people may rebel against you. You may lose your throne. Be wise, be soft. Be kind, be gentle, be accommodative, understand their weaknesses. This is not the language. They would have told all these things, but you know the scripture says, I don't care. I will not turn to the left or to the right. I will stick to what is right. How many times we are swayed by our circumstances, by peer pressure, by the things around us. How many times we give in to those things and think all is well. Josiah is teaching us, if you want a true revival in your life and in the life of your church, do not turn to the right or to the left. Just stay focused on what the Lord wants you to do in your life. That's what it says. So that the, the third one, the fourth one. Now the question is, as a young man, how was he able to do all this? You know how old was he when he did all this? Look at verse 4. Sorry, verse uh, verse 3, not verse 4, verse 3. For in the eighth year of his reign, he did all this in the eighth year of his reign, which means how old was he? I'm a preacher who loves to have some response, please. Anybody who would tell me, how old was he when he started doing all this revival and reformation? It's, the scripture says he was, he was in the eighth year of his reign. He was 16. Thank you. Thank you, my friend, whoever it was. He was only 16 years old when he did all these revivals. Now, what does 16-year-old kids do today? 16-year-old boys do today. 16-year-old boys do today. They chase after girls. They chase after sports. They chase after celebrities. They do everything opposite what the parents tell them in the home. That's the lifestyle of a 16-year-old in our modern day. Am I right? Am I speaking the truth? 16-year-old boy, Josiah. How was he able to do these great things at the age of only 16? Look at what this, how the scriptures answer him. I mean, address him in verse 3. For in the eighth year of his reign, you know what, he, what does it say? While he was still young. You know what the first thing he did? Somebody read it for me. While he was still young, what did he do? Please look into your Bibles. We have even forgotten to open our Bibles nowadays. Verse 3, 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 3. While he was still young, 
what did he do? He began to seek after the God of David, his father. Okay. Well, thank you, my friend. What does it say? He began to seek after God. You know why he was successful? Why he was able to revive himself and his nation? The first priority in his life was what? To seek after God. When? Not when he retired. Not when he was caught up. Caught up in some kind of problem that he approached God. It says while he was young. 16 years of age. He was successful because the first thing that he did was what? He sought the Lord and his presence. For him to be in the presence of God is more important than the, than the throne that he sat upon. That's the kind of a mindset this young 16-year-old boy had. It says he sought the Lord while he was young, just 16 years of old age. If you want a true revival, seek the Lord. Seek his face more than the throne, more than the pleasures, more than your job, more than anything else. So that's the fourth lesson I want you to learn about revival from his life. The fifth one, let's turn to verse 8. So he sought the Lord when he was 16 years old. He did what was right in the sight of God. He followed in the footprints of his ancestry, David. And he did not turn to the right or to the left. We got that. What's the fifth one? Turn with me to verse 8. Verse 8 of Second Chronicles chapter 34. In the 18th year of his reign. When do you think that is? What year? What was his age in the 18th year of his reign? What was his age? When he purged the land and the temple, 26. he sent... Sorry, somebody saying? 26. How old was he? 26. 26, thank you. <laughs> at the age of 26, this look at what he did. You know what he did at the age of 26? He repaired, if you read the whole chapter, he saw that the house of the Lord was in ruins. In other words, by the time he came to the throne, remember, his grandfather ruled for 55 years and his father ruled for how many years? 22 years. 55, 65, 75, 77 years of evil rule by his father and grandfather. During the 77 years of rule, you know what happened? The temple was closed. True worship was lost. They were worshipping idols and images and all. So what did he do? The fifth point, verse 8 onwards, it says, he repaired the temple. He repaired the temple. If you read carefully, he calls the Levite, the governor, and he calls the high priest, Shaphan and Helkai. And then he says, get into the temple and repair it. That's my priority. My dear friends, do you want a true revival? Repair the temple. Which temple? Not Bilston Seventh-day Adventist Church. There is a greater temple than that one. Which is it? Your body. You yourself is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Is it defiled? Can the Holy Spirit come and live in your heart happily? Is it clean enough for him to live? Your thoughts, your actions, your motives, how are they? Who are you in your privacy? Who are you in your public life? Are they two different people or it's the same person? Josiah, the scripture says he repaired the temple. If you want a true revival, repair your temple. See what has broken in your temple. Mend it, repair it. That the Holy Spirit can, the only way you can experience revival is when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. If not, there's no way. You can go through the emotions of church and Sabbath, tithe and witnessing and all that thing and still be lost because you have not a genuine conversion from within. So the fifth thing he did was to revive or the repair the temple. And that's what it says. What else did he say? You know what happened? When they were repairing the temple, the high priest and the Levites, they found something in the temple. Let's turn with me to chapter, uh, same chapter, verse 14. Verse 14. Now when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found what? 
found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. So as they were repairing the temple, they found the book of the law of Moses in the temple. So what did the high priest and uh, the Levite do? They immediately brought it to in front of the king. Read, read verse 18. Then Shaphan, the scribe, told the king, saying, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. I want you to picture this. As soon as he came with a book in front of King Josiah, and he said, look, we were repairing the temple. And in the temple, we found this book. And you know what Josiah said? What? Read it for me. I want to listen. My friend, it's not Psalms 23, 6 verses. It's not Psalms 117, 2 verses that you read for your morning devotion. It's not your WhatsApp message that you serve as your devotion and go rush to your work. The book of Moses is a long book. Josiah patiently listened to every word that was being read because he wanted to know what the word of the Lord says. So what's my sixth point? He read the word of God. And he waited on the word of the Lord. And when he heard the word of the Lord, when he heard what the scribe was reading to him, do you know what he did? Turn, see the next verse. Verse 20. Then the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahilam, the son of Shepha, about the son of Micah, the scribe and Asaiah, servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. So Helkiah and the king appointed him to Helkiah the prophet. What, what did they do? They went to, he said, go and find out what can be done. So what did he do in the meanwhile? Look at, uh, um, which was, he repent, um, okay, verse 19, sorry. Thus it happened when the king heard the words of the law. Sorry, it's verse 19. Thus it happened that when the king heard the words of the Lord, that he tore his clothes. So when the book was read to him, you know what he did? When he saw how the curses have been pronounced and how exactly these are fulfilling, he realized how serious the life is. He realized how much they have gone far away from God. He was a good man. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He shouldn't have done anything, but he repented for himself and for his church or for his nation it says he tore his clothes and he repented when he heard what the law of the god is saying his immediate reaction was repentance confession of his sins what about what about you you know every time i i really get frustrated sometimes every time i preach people say pastor mohan thank you i enjoyed your sermon i enjoyed your sermon it was a nice sermon you think I'm an entertainer that you enjoyed my sermon? When mm -hmm. John the Baptist preached, people said, what shall we do? When Peter preached, people said, what shall we do? When Josiah read the law of the Lord, he said he tore his clothes and repented. But when I preach, when you listen to God's word, what do we respond? I enjoyed it. It was such a wonderful sermon. Thank you, Pastor. No wonder there's no revival in our lives because we take it to our head. Wow, something new I learned from Pastor Mohan sermon today. That's all, it stays in the head. It doesn't go into the heart. How do you expect revival to come? Look at what Josiah did. When he heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes and repented of his sins. You want a true revival? Search your heart. Every time you hear God's word being read or you read it or you hear it speak spoken, does it really prick your heart? Do you feel the need for repentance? For cleansing of your life? Josiah teaches us that when you read the word of the Lord, it should prick you. Peter's message, Stephen's message, Paul's message. People were pricked and they got converted. For us, it's a different scenario. That should not happen. So that's the thing that I've learned from him. What did he do when he's found the land? He said, now 
now he understood what the problem is but he wants to know the direction he wants to know what shall we do now i know where the problem is we have sinned against god that's why we are experiencing this but what is the way forward you know what he did he sends the high priest and the levite shafan to go and meet the prophetess hulda or hulda to inquire of her what they should do now do you know my friends this is a key important person i want you to know if you want a true revival seek help from godly people today we approach so many people for help self help books are the most widespread books people love and buy them self help they go to counselors that have no morality and ethics have you approached a godly man a godly woman have you taken godly counsel josiah he could have called his own advisors he is a king he was 26 years old he could have called his wise men who serve in his cabinet he could have called his counselors his advisors instead he didn't approach any one of them when he heard the word of the lord he didn't say well wise men tell me what can we do you know what he said i don't want to talk to these wise people though they may be as wise as they can be i want to go and meet the prophetess to find out from her what is it that we need to do so he sends the high priest he didn't even ask the high priest advice he sends him to the prophetess to find out what are they supposed to do what is that to us if you want a true revival take good advice from godly people from god's word because they will have so they were sent to her and you know what she said what did she do she said i have a good news and a bad news turn with me to the same verse 23 was 23 then she answered them thus says the lord god of israel tell the man who sent you to me was 24 thus said the lord behold i will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants all the curses that are written in the book which they have read before the king of judah in other words she was saying tell the king that what all he heard being read for him will come to pass all the curses will be coming on this people the calamities will come that's the bad news what's the good news then why why was the bad news because verse 25 says because they have forsaken me and burned incense okay but the good news is in verse 26 but as for the king of juda who sent you to enquire of the lord in this manner you shall speak to him thus says the lord god of israel concerning the words which you have heard verse 27 because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before god when you heard his words against this place and against his inhabitants and you have humbled yourself before me and you tore your clothes and wept before me i also have heard you says the lord look at how the lord is so impressed with this man's revival he tore his clothes he humbled himself and the lord was so impressed that his conversion his revival was with genuine So what it is it was the good news verse 28 surely i will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which i will bring on this place and its inhabitants in other words what was the good news for josiah as much as i will definitely destroy this people bring this calamity on them but josiah because you have remained faithful you have tore your clothes you have repented you have humbled you know what i'm going to do i will not allow these calamities to come during your lifetime they will not attack you you will go to the grave in peace that means you will have a peaceful life i will allow them to come after you are gone but not in your lifetime that's the good news he gave so when josiah heard that as much as it was good news for him that he's not going to see them with his eyes but he still felt bad for what the lord is going to do you know what he did the next thing amazing amazing thing he did that's my final point turn with me look what he did was 29 onwards look at that then the king sent and gathered all the elders of judah and jerusalem the king went out to the house of the lord with all the men of judah and the inhabitants of jerusalem the priests the levite the people great and small and he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of his in other words he he restored true worship 
77 years of worship lost. I'm sure a generation of people would have passed by then. So he realized the only way to revive ourselves, get back to what we are called to be is to restore a true worship. So whom did he call to restore true worship? Verse 29 says, he first of all gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. Verse 30 says, he gathered all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, including the religious leaders, both small and great. Everybody, he gathered them together. Verse 30, what does it say? What does it say in verse 30? He read the book in their hearing, made sure that they all heard what the word of the Lord is saying to each one of them. What else do you think he did? Verse 31 is amazing. Then the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his covenants and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in his book. You know what he did? After reading the whole Torah for them, he himself raised his hands up and said, I make a covenant today that I will keep all the commandments of God, all the statutes of God, all my life. You want a true revival? You need Josiah's spirit. You need Josiah's heart. You need Josiah's covenant. That's the only way you can experience revival in your life. He did not only do it for himself. He gathered the, his whole nation. For Bilston, it's your whole church. You want a true revival? You must first of all make a covenant to walk with the Lord, no matter what the consequences is, and then call the assembly together and revive the whole church together. That's what Josiah did. You know, and then after he made his covenant, what did he tell his people to do? Look at verse 32. And he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to take a stand so that the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers. What does that mean? First, he made his covenant to follow the Lord faithfully and to keep his commandments, to walk in his ways. And the second, he made all his nation to make the same covenant. That from now on, no more images, no more idols, no more Baal worship. It is God and God alone. Do you want a revival? That's the commitment we need to make for God. Finally, verse 33, look at how it ends. Thus, Josiah removed all the abominations from all the country that belonged to the children of Israel and made all who were present in Israel diligently serve the Lord their God. All his days, they did not depart from following the Lord God of their fathers. How long they remained faithful? As long as he was alive, None of them departed from serving the Lord. And if you know the history, right after his death, they tend to turn back. Sometimes the leadership also matters how we lead the church towards revival. Finally, you know what the Bible says about this great man? Turn with me to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 23. 2 Kings chapter 20, 23 verse 25. This is what the Bible says about Josiah. Now, before him, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor after him did any rise like him. This is the secret of revival. You want a revival in your life? You want a revival in your church? Follow this principle. Follow this mantra that Josiah is leaving us. What does it say? There was no one like him, what? Who turned to the Lord with all your heart. You want a revival? Like Josiah, turn to the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And what else he did? And according to the law of Moses, he followed exactly what the law said, what the commandments of God said. That's the only way you can experience revival. The Holy Spirit will come upon those who are willing to be led by God and his word. That's how his life ends. You know. I read a story about a man called Rob, Robert Robinson. He's one of the hymn writers. He's from London here. When he was a young boy, his mother sent him to be an apprentice. But as a young boy, he was into drugs. He was into gangs. He did all sorts of... This is an 18th century story. But he felt so guilty of his life at the age of 20. He, there was a great preacher at the time by the name of Wakefield. He was preaching in one of the churches 
he went to listen to him and when he heard this sermon he was so much touched he realized how guilty he was he felt there is there was a revival that was happening in his life he felt there he should be revived so he gave his heart to the lord and at age 22 he became a pastor a methodist preacher and his church was in suffolk midden hall and then he after pastoring for a little while he went and pastored in norwich as an independent congregation but later he acted so when he joined this church he realized he has gone too far away from god he is coming back he wrote this hymn come thou fount of every blessing tune my heart to serve the lord prone to wonder lord i feel it he wrote that hymn while he was a young baptist minister but after some time he lost the passion for ministry and he left ministry he left ministry and one day while he was in london at, at once one place you know those days people would go on horse carriages to the church there was one this young woman a rich woman going to church on the way she saw this young man sitting by the road side and uh, as she stopped her horse carriage and said young man i'm going to church are you going to church church is a bit far from here if you want to ride i will give you a ride he didn't know what to say he was feeling so guilty he left ministry he left everything he is on the streets again he didn't know what to say but the w- woman's words felt like a solace to his heart so oh yeah yeah i'm going to church okay come sit on my carriage i'll take you with me so reluctantly he got onto the horse carriage sat next to the woman and then woman said man you seem to be so discouraged there's no happiness on your face let me read a poem to you at that time let me read a poem to you I, and this poem was such an inspiration to me so she put her hand into her purse removed a piece of paper and she started reading come thou fount of every blessing tune my heart and when robert robinson robert robinson when he heard these words he talked to he said to that woman woman where did you get those words he said this is written by a great man called robert robinson this is such a great blessing to me and the man says do you know who that man is and the woman says i don't know but i thank god for that man because this has been an inspiration to me robert robinson says to the woman it is me it is me who wrote that poem and she was shocked that she was sitting in the presence of a poet whom she admired all her life and do not know it was him and she says to him why are you like this read your own words what it says in fact let me read it what she actually says him she tells him he took the book nodding yes i wrote these words years ago oh how wonderful she exclaimed imagine i am sharing a carriage with the author of these very lines but there is after some time she actually tells him god's message for uh, I don't know. Okay, but the but the young woman responded by saying, "You also wrote. Here is my heart. Or oh, take and seal it. You can offer your heart again to God, Mr. Robinson. It's not too late." That's what she told him. What did she say? Remember, you said prone to wonder. I I see that. But in the same poem, you also wrote, "Here is my heart. Or oh, take and seal it." So, young Robinson, it's not too late. Give your heart to the Lord. dear church at bilston you want a revival give your heart to the lord like josiah or do your life to follow the lord no matter what the consequences and i believe you will experience revival as we sing or i'm not sure we're going to sing or play this song i want you to see the story behind this and after that incident robert robinson became a minister again he went back and pastored in cambridge for the rest of his life he even wrote books he wrote many other things he gave his heart to the lord he was revived i pray that you will never be the same again if you are truly genuinely sincerely searching for revival may god bless you that you may be revived to live close to him god bless you amen 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 O oh, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call 
for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore Thee. May I still Thy goodness prove, while the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by Thy help I've come, and I hope by Thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Never let me wander from thee, never leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts of Gracious Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts this afternoon. I pray that this will not be another sermon where they say I enjoyed this sermon. I've learned something new. But I pray, Lord, that this sermon will change our lives. They have chosen the theme revival. If they are really serious, may the message that we have heard from the life of Josiah revive us too, Lord. Like Josiah, may we do what is right in your sight. Following the footprints of our forefathers who walked faithfully and do not turn to the right or to the left. Lord, seek your presence evermore. Lord, repair the temple of our hearts. Burn down all the images that we have built in ourselves. Restore the true worship and make the covenant look Josiah that I will serve you with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my strength, and with all my mind. I pray that Bilston Church will experience true revival. The greatest need of today's church is a genuine revival. Lord, I pray that the church will have this vision. The leaders will have this vision. As individuals, we will have this commitment to bring revival amongst ourselves. Church membership, no guarantee to heaven. Tithe paying, Sabbath keeping is not guaranteed to heaven. We can be in the church and still be lost. Like how you say in Matthew 7, 21. Not all those who say, Lord, Lord, will enter into heaven. Not all those who claim to be Christians, do you know them because you said, I do not know you. I pray, Lord, that we will be serious Christians. We will live intentional lives. We will not chase after this world and its lusts and its pleasures. But take time like Josiah, even when we are young, at age 16, when all boys were chasing after girls and sports and other things, here is a young man who chased after you, who looked, who was after you. As a result, you blessed him. You revived him and his nation. Put away the plagues and the calamities during his lifetime because you honored his lifestyle. Lord, by our lifestyle, by our commitment, you can bless our nation, bless our churches. May we, Lord, revive ourselves that our lives will not be the same again. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Mohan. Thank you very, very, very much for your message to us. It is something that we have been looking forward to. And we realized that you were the right person to present the message to us today. We needed it and all of us here, we cannot really say that we enjoy it because uh, I imagine all of us was looking within our own self 
to see what we need to do for the Lord, what we need to do. Oh, we need to get to the point where God wants us and wants to use us for his glory. So we thank you very much and you've given us food for thoughts so that as we go through this coming week, we will continue to think and to petition the Lord to give us the strength that we need in order to do what is right in his sight. So we thank you very much for your ministry to us. And, uh, you know, we ask that we will have you again. And we know that you will come. It's not the first time you have spoken to us in Dilston. So we thank you very much for the message of the Bible that you have presented to us. At this time, the floor is open to the members to say their thank you to Pastor Mohan. Thank you.